David Fincher, going back to Fincher, something he does, because he's he's a his style of filmmaking freaks me out a little bit because it's so controlled. How do you decide when to move the camera and when not to move the camera? Yeah, moving the camera is it's interesting because and and often the director and I will discuss, you know, in pre-production, because some um, some directors or projects want uh, constant movement. That maybe it's like a light float, but that it's just always moving in some capacity. And then uh, on other projects or other directors, it's like, no, only moves when it's a very specific and important beat. Uh, I've had shows where we didn't move the camera, period. And I've had shows where it's never still. And so it really just, it, it so depends on the project and the director, really, because some of it's just taste. And, you know, I will have my own takes on it. Like uh, if I feel like, well, moving in this scene, this is such a, this, this character's really sad. And if the camera's moving around, it's going to feel too sexy or too exciting. And sh maybe because it's always moving, maybe now it being static is going to accentuate that because we're used to it moving and vice versa. So context really dictates all of it, but you do want there to be a reason. Not even if it's a show where everything's moving, why is it always moving? You don't like it's tricky when when the reason is, oh, it's just cool. Like it's it's not that that's wrong. There's no right or wrong. But for me, again, thoughtfulness is so important to me. Like, why are things happening? And if the reason is because it's cool, like, that's not wrong, you know? I, it's just less exciting. It's harder for me to sink my teeth into that. And I think uh, I can get lazy, I, you know, if it's just like, well, there's no, I'm just kind of sliding the camera around, then I, if I'm not thinking about what I'm doing, uh, you know, by, by day three, just like what well, what am I doing here? So so it's it's tricky, but you know you want you want traveling with like uh, something that David Fincher going back to Fincher something he does because he's he's a his style of filmmaking freaks me out a little bit because it's so controlled and I get nervous like would I even be able to survive a David Fincher shoot I don't know, but his camera tends to lock into actors if actors are moving the camera's moving and they're in sync and. That's pretty impressive. Like when somebody's getting up and sitting down, the camera, but that takes, you know, he does a hundred takes of stuff. Like it, that's hard. That's really hard work. Uh, but that's an approach that makes sense is if actor moves, camera moves. If actor's still, camera's still. Uh, but there is just, you know, there is everywhere. I mean, a Michael Bay thing, the camera's always alive, but that's because he wants it all to be a roller coaster ride. And so it's not, again, it's not wrong. It's just like, that's the, that's the aesthetic. So I guess it starts from a vision and then hopefully the camera's movement or lack thereof, it, 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 at least there's like a string connecting it to that original vision and again, intention. Did you see Uncut Gems? I did, yes. That's it, yeah, Uncut Gems, constantly moving camera, which makes per that ca that character is constantly moving. So yeah, that's a perfect example of something that like, there's a reason for that. And then it's just like, go, 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 because it's a whirlwind. His whole life is a whirlwind, yeah. Especially in the jewelry store oh. or out on the street. Yeah, it was just constant. And, and, it, and it, it, I think it, it works so well for mm -hmm. that film. And it, was, yeah. it really conveyed who he was as a character, what his world was like. Yeah, yeah that's actually a much better example because I know Michael Bay brings a lot of, like people have a lot of associations, but Uncut Gems is a great example of constant camera movement for a reason and very effective. It feels very chaotic. Yeah. That's great. What tools or equipment should a beginning cinematographer buy early because they're going to be using them all the time? That's a good question. I think, you know, if you can get a fast lens, I think that is a very useful tool. A lens that can, you know, opens up to 
at least a two, let's say. Well, I'd say two eight is a good minimum, but if you can get something like these Rokinons I mentioned, those are a 1.5 or something. Uh, I think a fast lens is a very valuable tool for a couple reasons. One, you can shoot in lower light situations, so it just, just helps when you don't have a lot of gear, but also it can sh teach you uh, about depth of field because you can get to the extreme and you can see what a very shallow depth of field can do for you which but also a deep depth of field so I think that's one of the I would probably start there and then beyond that you know I think it's it's getting easier now but like a strong light but those are hard to find cheap but a strong light source I've noticed if you can have a strong light source coming in a window it gives you such a great baseline to start from, but usually a bigger light is something that requires a bigger crew and more money. So that's maybe a little more wishful thinking. Uh, there's an app called Sunseeker, and I think there are a couple other versions, but it can tell you, you know, uh, where the sun will be at any time of day on any day of the year. And if you can really choose those spots, I use it for 100% of the spot, unless I'm in a set where, where there are no windows, uh, I wanna know where the sun is gonna be and when. And then I'm gonna use that to decide what direction we face and what time of day we wanna shoot there. So I think that that's an indispensable tool as far as I'm concerned. It's kind of expensive, but uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's worth its weight in gold. And actually along those lines, there's an app called Artemis, which you can put in any camera and any set of lenses, and it will ingest that. And then you can take it, you can be like, oh, I wanna see on an Alexa mini 50 millimeter from this position, that's what this will look like. Oh, actually, no, we're shooting a different camera. It's going to be a Black Magic. It's going to be a, the 6K pocket cam, and we, we only have a 40 millimeter. You plug it in, and same thing. So you can really get a sense of what each lens is going to show you in a space. So I think those are, those are I mean, I use both of those tools constantly on every set I've been on, for sure. So I think those are huge. Um, yeah, I think those are those would be the big ones. Yeah. Anything maybe hold off on? It's not as necessary. Well, I you know I think we have um, we all have obsessions with cameras, like camera brands, and I think nowadays, especially, uh, what you can get with a one thousand dollar camera blows my mind, and I think. You know there are benefits to cameras like an Alexa or or a Red or whatever. They all have they all have their advantages, but uh, not feeling like you have to get a high end camera to shoot a high end image uh, that is not the case anymore. I would say um, one thing: if your camera does not have internal ND filters, neutral density filters, one piece of gear that I think you do need are neutral density filters and they have nowadays a bunch of different brands of um, variable NDs and that's something that you can screw on to the end of a lens and you can twist it and it will um, allow more or less light into your camera and there are a number of reasons that that's beneficial but ideally it allows you to start being conscious about shooting at certain f-stops it gives you control so like shooting, um, you know, I've shot shows where we're really opening up and it's a shallower depth of field, a little aimed more toward beauty and you're shooting at like a, a two or for a lot of it. But then there are other times where I'm like, no, we're gonna shoot at a four and it's deeper depth of field and it feels different, but you, you don't have that control unless you have a neutral density filter. So that's something to get. Um, but in terms of, yeah, I think not obsessing about quality of your camera. I think that's something that we all get hung up on. But the, the, what you can get now, is it, it just boggles my mind. It's unbelievable. So I think the, the, the floor has come up so high in terms of the floor of your image is always going to be pretty good now. 
in terms of what the camera can give you at least. So yeah, not obsessing about an expensive camera is probably a big thing. Can you dispel the myth? Can you really fix it in post? <laughs> I hate fixing it in post. I am not a believer in fixing it in post. For one, it will often not get fixed in post because just like in production, when you run out of time and money, people run out of time and money in post. And so a lot of things end up just getting tossed by the wayside. Um, and you know, it's important to know when you can fix something if you're you know you're on set and you're running out of time and you're you're the sun is going down it's like well we're almost out of light but we can still shoot this but in post they're gonna have to pull it up it's not gonna look as good but you know the range it's like we can get it to a certain so sometimes out of necessity but i i hate fixing it in post i i think it's when you start hearing that which you will hear all the time and i will say it sometimes uh, but that should never be where you land if you don't have to. And then when you have to, that's the beauty. You can do so much in post these days, but you shouldn't set out with that as your initial attitude for sure. You've been asked to do a commencement speech at a college. Mm -hmm. What are your final words to young cinematographers, upcoming generation of filmmakers, cinematographers? Yeah, you know, I never would have guessed this, and I, I touched on this earlier, but coming into this industry, I never would have guessed how far kindness can get you, being pleasant to work with. People are, I've gotten, I don't know what other cinematographers do, but a lot of them apparently it's not good because the amount of times that different departments, specifically art departments, well, no, and sound and costume that will come up to me. And I'm not, I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm just a normal person. The amount of times that departments come up to me, I'm like, Andy, you're so nice. I love working with you. It feels like they've been abused puppies that somebody's now giving them a biscuit. Like I'm not. So for me, and I, same with producers, I've had producers tell me outright, that the reason that they rehire me is because of the atmosphere I create on set. Not the visual atmosphere, just the vibe. And I never would have thought that that would get me work. That never even occurred to me. I'm thankful that that's true. It's, it's been good for my career. But I think remembering that this is your life. Like the way you spend your day to day is your life. And when you're on set, if you suck to be around, if you're unpleasant to be around, that is not going to serve you. And what an amazing gift that being nice and happy can be good for your career. Like that, that feels too good to be true, but that's exactly what I've found. And so, I think embracing film has opened me up as a person, got me to be more confident, less shy, because I love it so much. And if it's also teaching me to meditate and be kinder, I never yell. I never, ever yell on set. I want to yell, but I don't. It's teaching me to like control my emotions. Don't blow up. Be patient. That's, I, I just... It, it's, it brings me so much joy to think that being better at my career makes me a better person and being a better person makes me better at my career. So I would think that's the best piece of advice is allow your goodness as a person to help you be a better craftsman, better to work with. Everybody wants that, I would assume, in every field. You said you went on some road trips um, after 2009. You know, you kind of... Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you didn't really have that much weighing you down. And, mm -hmm. and you, what did you see on some of these road trips? Yeah, I, I'm the big, there was some quote that somebody once told me that Akira Kurosawa said, and then I've tried to find it and I've never found it. So I have no idea. Somebody just said it to me. But um, to be a good filmmaker, live an interesting life. And I spent a good chunk of my late 20s and early 30s living a weird life on the road. I was traveling. I slept on couches. I slept in cars. I slept on the ground. Like I was 
I was adventuring. I was I was living a life, and I was um, looking at the world around me, like literally just looking at the world. Uh, part of that is looking at light, but part of that seeing, you know, mountains in the snow versus desert in in the summer versus you know the, the seeing an ocean, a quiet lake, a busy city. These all have a feeling to them, an emotion, and having that experience, you never know what kind of script will come your way and what you'll be able to touch on. And then ultimately, people is to to connect with strangers, a stranger on a bus in the middle of Italy or you know wherever, to to connect with different people or just watching people. I think that just gives you it gives you a richer life, which then gives you a richer palette to pull from when you're coming up with ideas. So I, I really am a big believer. Now I do wonder sometimes, had I maybe started my career a little earlier, would I be further along now? But what I did in my late 20s, early 30s, this kind of vagabond life was interesting. And I would imagine it's painted my experience, which I bring to my work for sure. So I think making sure I'm a huge film nerd, but living some life outside of movies, I think is a very valuable thing. You know, connect with the world around you as best you can.